Chapter Three of the Seven Poor Travellers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. The Seven Poor Travellers in Three Chapters by Charles Dickens. Chapter Three, The Road. My story being finished, and the wassail too, we broke up as the cathedral bell struck twelve. I did not take leave of my travellers that night, for it had come into my head to reappear in conjunction with some hot coffee at seven in the morning. As I passed along the high street, I heard the waits at a distance, and struck off to find them. They were playing near one of the old gates of the city at the corner of a wonderfully quaint row of red-brick tenements, which the clarionet obligingly informed me were inhabited by the minor canons. They had odd little porches over the doors, like sounding-boards over old pulpits, and I thought I should like to see one of the minor canons come out upon his top stop, and favour us with a little Christmas discourse about the poor scholars of Rochester, taking for his text the words of his master, relative to the devouring of widows' houses. The clarionet was so communicative, and my inclinations were, as they generally are, of so vagabond a tendency, that I accompanied the waits across an open green called the Vines, and assisted, in the French sense, at the performance of two waltzes, two polkas, and three Irish melodies, before I thought of my inn any more. However, I returned to it then, and found a fiddle in the kitchen, and Ben, the wall-eyed young man, and two chambermaids, circling round the great deal table with the utmost animation. I had a very bad night. It cannot have been owing to the turkey or the beef, and the wassail is out of the question, but in every endeavour that I made to get to sleep I failed most dismally. I was never asleep and in whatsoever unreasonable direction my mind rambled, the effigy of Master Richard Watts perpetually embarrassed it. In a word, I only got out of the worshipful Master Richard Watts's way by getting out of bed in the dark at six o'clock, and tumbling, as my custom is, into all the cold water that could be accumulated for the purpose. The outer air was dull and cold enough in the street when I came down there, and the one candle in our supper-room at Watts's charity looked as pale in the burning as if it had had a bad night too. But my travellers had all slept soundly, and they took to the hot coffee and the piles of bread and butter, which Ben had arranged like deals in a timber-yard, as kindly as I could desire. While it was yet scarcely daylight, we all came out into the street together, and there shook hands. The widow took the little sailor towards Chatham, where he was to find a steamboat for Sheerness. The lawyer, with an extremely knowing look, went his own way, without committing himself by announcing his intentions. Two more struck off by the cathedral and old castle for Maidstone, and the book peddler accompanied me over the bridge. As for me, I was going to walk by Cobham Woods as far upon my way to London as I fancied. When I came to the stile and footpath by which I was to diverge from the main road, I bade farewell to my last remaining poor traveller, and pursued my way alone. And now the mists began to rise in the most beautiful manner, and the sun to shine, and as I went on through the bracing air, seeing the hoar-frost sparkle everywhere, I felt as if all nature shared in the joy of the great birthday. Going through the woods, the softness of my tread upon the mossy ground and among the brown leaves enhanced the Christmas sacredness by which I felt surrounded. As the whitened stems environed me, I thought how the founder of the time had never raised his benignant hand, save to bless and heal, except in the case of one unconscious tree. By Cobham Hall I came to the village, 
and the churchyard where the dead had been quietly buried in the sure and certain hope which Christmas time inspired. What children could I see at play, and not be loving of, recalling who had loved them? No garden that I passed was out of unison with the day, for I remembered that the tomb was in a garden, and that she, supposing him to be the gardener, had said, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. In time the distant river with the ships came full in view, and with it pictures of the poor fishermen mending their nets, who arose and followed him, of the teaching of the people from a ship pushed off a little way from shore by reason of the multitude, of a majestic figure walking on the water in the loneliness of night. My very shadow on the ground was eloquent of Christmas, for did not the people lay their sick where the mere shadows of the men who had heard and seen him might fall as they passed along? Thus Christmas begirt me far and near, until I had come to Blackheath, and had walked down the long vista of gnarled old trees in Greenwich Park, and was being steam-rattled through the mists, now closing in once more, towards the lights of London. Brightly they shone, but not so brightly as my own fire, and the brighter faces around it, when we came together to celebrate the day. And there I told of worthy Master Richard Watts, and of my supper with the six poor travellers, who were neither rogues nor proctors and from that hour to this I have never seen one of them again. End of chapter 3 Recording by Ruth Golding End of The Seven Poor Travellers by Charles Dickens